In today's video, we're going to be tackling the very first part of the first unit in AP Biology, section 1.1 in accordance with the CED, which covers much of chapter 3 of Campbell Biology on water. Hey guys, this is Mikey with AVO Prep Academy coming to you with fresh first semester content for AP Bio. So if you're in AP Biology or just a big fan of science, be sure to like and subscribe. Today we're talking about water and we'll approach this section by dividing our discussion of water into two parts. First, the structure of water that gives it its special properties and second, these four special properties of water and their importance for living systems. Let's begin by discussing water structure. It does help to know a tiny bit of chemistry here, so I'll sprinkle in a bit of chem here too. First, we have to know that water is a covalent compound created from one part oxygen and two parts hydrogens. The fact that it's a covalent molecule though, means that the outer electrons, also known as valence electrons, between these three atoms are shared so that each atom can have its preferred eight or two electrons in its outermost shell. But what's important is that these electrons are all negatively charged while the center of the atoms, known as the nucleus, have positively charged protons inside. Now, by the way, from this point onward all the way to May, just remember that for AP biology, positive and negatives can be thought of as magnetic poles rather than some electric charge. So in the case of positives and negatives, while well, they attract one another, whereas negative and negatives repel and so on. So let's take a look at why this is important for our understanding of water's properties. In this diagram, we can clearly see that there are two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom at the center. We also see that water has a bent shape rather than being linear. Okay, so let's put those protons and electrons into play here. Oxygen here at the center has eight protons in its nucleus. Hydrogen, on the other hand, has only one proton. So these two electrons in between oxygen and hydrogen would be much more attracted to the oxygen atom because, well, there's more positive pull on the oxygen side. So considering that this would occur for both hydrogen atoms, what we see in water is that electrons are always hanging around the oxygen atom, while the probability of them hanging around near hydrogen would be near zero. So what does this mean? Well, if we do the math, we know that in totality, there are 10 protons and 10 electrons in a single water molecule. And that should make it neutral. But because these electrons are near the oxygen side, water becomes slightly negative on that side while slightly positive on the hydrogen side. Now this simple phenomenon is extremely important because it's this very nature of water with its opposing partial charges that gives water its polarity. And the name sort of makes sense. We have the North Pole and the South Pole because they have different magnetic charges and we can say basically the same thing about water with its poles. But for water, it's the structural and electrical nature that allows it to gain four incredibly important properties which we'll discuss next. Now, for this section on the properties, let's list them out first. One, cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. Two, water's ability to moderate temperature. Three, water's expansion upon freezing. And four, water as a universal solvent. Let's begin with cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. So earlier, we discussed how water is polar. Part of what happens as a result of this is that water molecule is attracted to other water molecules. This diagram demonstrates this perfectly. As you can see, each water molecule can orient itself in such a way that its partially positive side can form an attractive relationship with a partially negative side of another water molecule. And each water molecule can form four of these relationships with adjacent water molecules. Oh, and the term for this attractive force is hydrogen bonding, a term that you definitely need to add to your toolkit. So with each water molecule being attracted to other water molecules, it goes without saying that water is a bit sticky. This is actually recognizable even at the macroscopic level. When you have a bit of water, you might have noticed that it forms a droplet. The fact that it's a droplet instead of some flattened sheet of water tells you that water is sticky within and to itself. Now adhesion is similar to cohesion, but instead of water sticking to one another, it's the ability of water to stick onto other things that may also have their own partial charges. So for instance, if you imagine a blade of grass in the morning dew, there might be a small droplet of water that seems to stick onto the blade, even against the force of gravity. And that's what adhesion is. Now let's take a moment to talk about why adhesion and cohesion is important for living systems. 
When you look at a tall tree, it has the ability to translocate water from the roots all the way up to the atmosphere. Now, we don't need to get into too much physiology for AP Bio, but you do have to know that as water moves from the roots up, it travels through a capillary vessel called the xylem. Now, the xylem, considering it was biological at one point anyway, would have slight polarity along the entire column of it. And as a result, water will use its adhesive property to stick to the size of the xylem while also pulling up additional water molecules below it as it travels up to the leaves and eventually into the air surrounding the tree. Okay, so what about surface tension? Well, again, due to the polar nature of water, water has a tendency to form a surface that requires some pressure to break through. This property of water can be leveraged by certain insects and plants like lily pads that can use the surface of water as its own ecosystem. Next is water's ability to moderate temperature, which sounds a bit vague. So let's flesh this out a little bit first. Now, we have to understand that water has a relatively high specific heat. This means that it actually requires a lot of heat energy to change the temperature of water. So if you've ever tried to boil a big pot of water for pasta, you'd know how long it actually has to sit there for the water to heat up sufficiently to boil. Now in practice, it means that a lot of ambient heat can be absorbed by water, which then can retain all of that energy. So for instance, in California, areas near the coast stay much cooler than the more inland areas because the ambient heat from the sun goes into that ocean. And within the oceans, even areas near hydrothermal vents can house organisms because water doesn't simply boil off with magma rising from the planet. And also, AP Biology likes to add here that water, as it transitions from liquid to gas, also takes up energy from its surroundings allowing sweat to cool us down in hot conditions. The third property of water is its expansion upon freezing. So as it turns out, most things, when they solidify, become more dense, as in all of the molecules get closer together. But for water, things go the other way. So when water becomes solid, it becomes less dense and it expands with more spacing between each water molecule in an ice's crystalline structure. Now you may have seen this phenomenon where freezing a plastic bottle of water basically deforms that bottle as ice expands within it. So what is the biological significance of this? Well, it turns out that in winter, as temperatures drop, bodies of water begin to freeze. But because the cold ambient temperature is realized at the surface of water, the surface freezes first. And because ice is less dense than the liquid water, it flows to the top, eventually forming a solid layer of ice that naturally insulates the water below from the cold air. And that allows temperatures to remain reasonable within the water and allowing ponds and even larger lakes to be habitable over winter, which then allows the continuity of life between seasons. The last property of water is perhaps the most important one for the purpose of the next couple of units, and it's water's ability to act as a great solvent. So what does it mean to be a solvent? Well, in chemistry, a solvent is anything that solutes can dissolve into. And in practice, it's like adding salt into water. And whether you stir it or not, you know that salt seemingly disappears or dissolves well into water. Now, here again, we see the importance of water's polarity. Because water is slightly negative and positive, Anything that has its own charge can interact with water and effectively dissolve. So with sodium chloride, which dissolves into positive sodium ions and negative chloride ions, would naturally dissolve well in water. Now this diagram illustrates how water can form these hydration shells to dissociate the salt molecules. And it's not just NaCl, but any ionic compound that dissolves. And it's not only ionic compounds that dissolve in water, because even larger covalent molecules, so long as they have some polar areas like this lysozyme here, would have sufficient interactions with water to dissolve as well. So it turns out that ionic and polar substances dissolve well in water, and we can collectively call them hydrophilic substances, a term that describes water-loving things. What about things that don't dissolve in water? Well, they're called hydrophobic, and these describe non nonpolar substances that do not have any interactions with water, thereby separating out. These would be things like oils and fats, as you may already know from, you know, real life. Great, that just about covers most important bits of this section. Now there is a bit of discussion on acids, bases, and buffers, and while you have to know a little bit about acids and bases, this isn't a chemistry class, meaning that we'll learn about how pH affects biology a bit later anyway, so we'll deal with it then. But for now, I hope this video has been helpful to you, and if so, consider subscribing to our channel and help us break 5,000 subs by the end of this first term. This has been Mikey with AVO Prep Academy. We'll see you in the next video.